Hello and welcome to an all new episode of the Lisa Ann Experience. I am your host and I'd like to extend my gratitude to you for making me a part of your listening experience. If you're new to my podcast, it releases in your ear every Wednesday on all platforms and Friday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We get together my community on YouTube, the real Lisa Ann, and I drop the video component as a live premiere. So that also covers the fact that if you are just discovering the Lisa Ann experience for your first time, you can go back and catch up on previous episodes on my YouTube channel. All of my platforms are the same, the real Lisa Ann. I keep it simple. I worked hard to get it there to make sure nobody is getting scammed or falling for a fake account, promoting that I'm doing something that I'm definitely not. So again, thank you for being here. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and never miss an episode. I also do some travel vlogs on there, some sports vlogs, a lot of different stuff that's kind of the home of everything. Speaking of home, I just got home. Chicago Exotica was this past weekend. It was a great show. I got in yesterday and as I always do, unpacked and put everything away before I even checked an email. Uh, You know, when you're on the car going back in the cab, coming from the airport to the city, you're catching up as much as you can. But then when I get in, I'm like, nothing should matter more than putting everything away and feeling like I'm home. Because when you unpack properly down to your makeup bag, whether you duplicate toiletry bag is the jam. That's what you really need to have. But if you don't makeup and things, I don't have duplicates of everything. So I like to just put everything away and you wake up the next day like, oh yeah, that's right. I was gone just yesterday. I also wanted to put everything away and get everything super organized because I am joined by a little buddy. Uh, I can see him from here as I record with you right now. Archie is sprawled out on his favorite piece of my furniture. I have him for a couple of days this, well, I have him this week. And uh, we had scheduled this a while back. And when I got the dates where Archie's parents were going to be traveling and needed somebody to look after him, it was ideal because I was like, oh, that's the day I get back from Exotica. And there's no better way to like recharge and just feel better than to just have this pet in my home, to have Archie. And it was beautiful. Landed yesterday. It was like the perfect Archie weather because when I watched him over the holidays, I will say it's a different experience walking a dog when you have to get up in the morning and put on five layers and all of these things and not only your coat, but his coat and everything else. Summertime, it's like, Oh, you just grab your keys, put your phone in your pocket, you roll out the door. So great to know that I was going to have Archie. So I got him yesterday, went for a beautiful walk in the park, had a great time. And I was texting with Joanna and I let Joanna know like, oh, I've got Archie for a couple of days. And Joanna Angel gave me the absolute best description of what it's like to have pets because Joanna has a couple of dogs. And so I said, you know how this feels. And Joanna says, having a pet is like when you're a kid and you have an imaginary friend, but it's like a live version of that imaginary friend. And that is, I've read it like three times. I'm like, Joanna, that is so profound, Uh, incredibly profound, but it's true because Archie is like, he's not my dog. Uh, but we get to spend time when I see him in the building, we just go nuts. We see each other. He jumps up on me. I mean, and he's just a doodle. He's a very well-behaved dog, but he's got a great personality and they're incredibly soothing. And you're talking to a dog that you're visualizing how they're receiving uh, the data that you're giving them, right? Just like you would your imaginary friend. So great description by the brilliant Joanna Angel, who was one of many people that I got to spend time with last weekend. But before I went away, I went to the Soho house, Joanna Angel again. I went to Soho house for Addis Fouché's event that she's putting together every other month. These incredibly thought-provoking conversations. The topic this time was orgasms. I knew Joanna was speaking on the panel. I know Addis but I had kept asking Joanna if Joanna knew Addis and Joanna had not met Addis yet. So I had just had Addis on Lisa Ann's backstage convos, my Sapphire podcast. I knew Addis was putting this event on, spoke to Lainey. Lainey introduced Joanna 
to Addis to be on the panel, but they still had not met yet. So I was like, okay, Addis knows I'm coming. Lainey knows I'm coming. I'm not going to tell Joanna I'm coming because again, I've been trying to get these two to meet forever. And I was going to surprise Joanna because I assumed that Aaron would go. And I knew that Aaron would then have to sit by himself. So I was like, I'm going to get there a little bit early, get an extra spot in case Aaron does arrive, which he did. And I will sit there with Aaron while Joanna is on this panel talking about orgasms. And I will say like, Joanna is a captivating speaker. Remember, Joanna's written two books. I always tell her to bring them to Exotica. She's like, oh, it was so long ago. A lot of people don't know Joanna wrote two books and they were both really fun reads. So she's a great storyteller. So of course, having Joanna sit on a panel and and hold court with the room was just awesome. She was brilliant. She was surprised I was there. And that was the night before. Yeah, it was like before I was getting ready to leave for Exotica. One of these days, it all kinds of runs together. I think it was Tuesday, but I had something out Wednesday. It was a big, hectic week out. And then I get out and think, okay, I'm going to get into Exotica on Thursday. Yeah, it was. I like to get in a day early. I like to get in a day early, settle in, get all of the deliveries, remember the logistics part of my operation, uh, shipping all the books, the merch, the things that I'm going to have at the show. That all gets to the hotel. Then I usually have to track it down there. Then I usually have to track somebody down with a cart. Books are heavy. Books are not ideal. You're always schlupping heavy things. So get those in inventory set up. I did a cool little time lapse for it on my TikTok at the really sand. If you want to see what that actually looks like. But I also knew that the first night I got in, I was going to get to have a dinner, just me, catch up with Lexi Luna, talk life, her experience so far, getting into the industry. And I realized as I was walking over to meet up with Lexi, that at these shows, I get to live every single generation of the industry, whether it's mine or someone else's. Uh, but I get to see it from my perspective of all of my peers that'll be from Christy Canyon, who I met when I was 18 and still working at Al's Diamond Cabaret, to Lexi Luna or to um, Kiki the Clout, to, to, to the newer performers that have come in and what they see differently and what's been different. And so we had a really great dinner, got to really talk. And I love to see where someone's head's at, like what has been, you know, what's had a positive impact on you, what has not, you know, where do you see yourself going with this? How are you enjoying it? And I love that Lexi had this conversation to kind of pregame this with all of us on my podcast here. So Lexi was just on and Lexi talked about the year of the fan and being more deliberate with time and not rushing as much, not over, over overwhelming as much to be as busy and having more time to engage. I think one of the craziest things is the choices that we as creators, as freelancers, as independent, we have to be thinking about so many things a day and we have to be creating and we have to be posting. We have to be engaging and something always slips when you're busy traveling or you're busy shooting. You're on set. Your phone's not in your hand. You can't stay caught up by the time you go to catch up. You're a hundred messages deep. You know, it's, it's that constant kind of battle. And so both of us being on that same plane this year of wanting to be more deliberate, wanting to be moving a bit less, but doing more things with our downtime, me getting to enjoy Archie over there who just let out a big sigh, uh, and, and getting to read more this summer and take that time and engage more and be more present. We had a great, ch really great chat. And that was what kind of launched me to how I'm going to enjoy the rest of my time in Chicago. We went down, we got done with dinner early because we got together early. We went down to the hotel lobby. There's usually an event. And we were at that cusp where it's like, we're 30 minutes before it starts. We really didn't want to drink because it's the day before the show starts. And we've got a long weekend. And we didn't really want to stand there. So I was like, you know, if we make the right decision and uh, we go up right now, I wanted to catch up on the Masters. I ended up getting to watch some of Thursday's uh, work uh, while I was on the plane. I wanted to catch up on the Masters. I want to catch up on sleep. I wanted to just chill to be completely ready for everything that I was going to be doing at Exotica. I was going to start Exotica a little bit differently this year, a little charity component. 
I am kicking off Exotica Chicago a little bit different. I've got a charity component that I've added in for this year, and I am going to the show early, super cash, gonna have some conversations, and then I'm gonna change. Ribbon cutting is at 5 p.m. See you, Chicago Exotica. I cannot wait to be back with real loyal fans. So what's interesting is I normally don't do interviews at shows, believe it or not. Uh, AVN, Exotica, what have you, because you are talking so much and I really want to save my voice for every question that's asked to be everybody fan that walks up or a new performer or a company in the business that wants to speak with me. And so you end up realizing that you're going to be speaking for maybe eight to 12 hours in a day. It's a lot of talking. Staying hydrated is clutch like so, a little liquid death there, but you're going to be speaking. So to do interviews, especially at the booth, because it's really loud and they often ask you to project louder than the music in the background. So they don't have to deal with a text strike if they put it up on their YouTube or what have you. And so that's really loud. And then to get in and to give, to do an interview beforehand, like when you're traveling, you are always doing interviews beforehand. So uh, when I was in Australia, there was press for me every day in a press room before I would be at the booth, but the booth hours were shorter. They were like four hours instead of eight hours. So to do two hours of press beforehand doesn't drain you, but it does drain you a bit. But this time was very different because when Dan from Exotica brought to me that the, the team at Chatterbait wanted to have me on a podcast, they were offering to pay me for my time. I said, okay, this allows me to take this money for a charity component that I'm working on for a project that I completed earlier and people that I met while doing that project. So elusive. That was such an elusive description. You know, everything and nothing all at the same time. Just let me let you know that you trusted my mission. My mission is for a good cause. I am going to be announcing it in May because I, I hope to use my birthday month as a big campaign month for charity, but I went to them back and said, hey, yes, I will do it for this amount and then I'll match whatever you're going to give because I'm going to give this all back to charity because you're going to give me this. So would you want to do this for charity with me? And they were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And they ended up offering me a little bit more since it's all going to charity. This is amazing. So I was like, perfect. I'll go into the show in casual clothes do the interviews because I thought that would at least save me from being as tired because when you're in your dress and your heels and you're propped up a certain way, I thought if I put on sneakers and some comfy pants and a little top, I'll be two hours, be doing interviews and that, and then I'll change. It'll feel like a new day. Exactly what I did. Had a great time. Really nice them to offer to pay me. Didn't want to accept the money. Wanted to use this as the base, the foundation for this work that I'm doing to raise money. So that was really a great positive way to start the show. And remember, I keep, if you're new, you don't know this, if you're listening every week, which I appreciate so much, I've been bringing up the Blue Zone documentaries so much. Blue Zone documentary series on Netflix, please watch it because when you watch it, you'll understand why I keep bringing it up. There are so many elements that you wouldn't expect that are involved in Blue Zone culture. Blue Zone culture is places in the world, zones, lifestyles, communities that live to be over a hundred years old. Now, hey, maybe we're not all pining to live to be over a hundred years old, but if we are, we want to be in that place in the most comfort. We want to be able, we want to be doing things. I read about these 90 some year old weightlifters. So one of the things is charity, community, of course, faith, but charity, doing things for others. And so that really reminded me that when I was going through a very dark time, I really leaned into charity and I realized how good it made me feel. And I realized it was a temporary pacifier, a way to stay busy and committed. But then it gave me this fuel that I was like, wow, I didn't realize I could make this much money for others. And this way I should continue to add this. But like anything, we get busy. And though I still do my Alzheimer's walk, though I still raise for blessings in my backpack, though I will raise not as committed as I was. So I realized, get your commitment back. How are you going to get your commitment back? Well, anytime an opportunity is offered that you would normally say no to or not be interested in, reconsider, could this be valuable? Is this worth doing to add into that charity component? Are you so 
it was worth it because I did feel different when I went into change and went over the booth and it was empty when we went into the show a couple of hours before everybody got there so I could be in the podcast studio room they had set up. By the time we got out, you know, and I'm in my clothes getting ready to change, There's you start to see the energy coming in. The music was starting to go. The doors weren't quite open yet because I always make sure that I take part of one of the very fun things about Exotica, the ribbon cutting. Exotica Chicago, we are here. And as I was with my group right here, having a great time, catching up with everybody, just cut the ribbon, I felt different. I felt like I had already taken a step to make this show different than other shows. I did something so totally different and it felt great and it had purpose and I'm so glad I did it. Thank you, Chatterbait, for reaching out to me. I'll make sure I let every one of you know when you're going to be able to Get your ears and eyes on this conversation. That was awesome. I think I'm the end of their this season. They're saving me for last. I'll let you know. You'll also know soon uh, what will unfold with this charity project that I'm working on right now and how you can help me. And you'll be able to get involved in May, the month of my birthday, where I really hope to remind everybody I have not received gifts in a very long time. I don't want gifts. And if anybody is compelled to buy me anything, you can just make a donation in my name uh, to whatever your charity of choice is or a charity of choice for me. Before I get to a guest, which I'm super excited to bring this guest, I'm going to actually cross paths with this guest again uh, in a week. And it's funny how you don't know somebody, you meet them for the first time, and then you start crossing paths with them. That's just how the universe aligns. I love this little human's energy. But after day one of the show, Justin and I went to dinner. Justin and I traveled together. Justin does all of my events with me. One of my best friends does all my East Coast, all my exoticas with me. And a lot of times, you know, Justin and I get together in the city and do dinner and lunch or what have you, but we've been not syncing our schedules well. And I said, we have going to have to have a catch up dinner at Exotica where we don't invite anybody. We just one dinner to you and I, we have to catch up. We have so much to catch up on. And I like to get to this show early, show open in Chicago at five. A lot of time, the other locations don't open until six. I like five because I can leave right before nine. It gets a little bit rowdy. People have been partying. People have been drinking down the bar by nine. So we could leave, make the reservation at 930. I had this all set before the day started. So we went out and had a beautiful dinner. And when we were coming back from dinner, walking to the hotel, and the reason we ate at Gibson's is because it's right there. And yes, everyone's always like, oh, you're in Chicago. You should go here. You should go there. I'm keeping it simple all about kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. The days are long. The, everything is so convenient. The convention center, the airport, the hotel, the restaurant, all so close. Why make it more of an effort? An hour. I've done it when we've been in Miami where we go into Miami for dinner. It's an hour some to get there. It's an hour some to get back. Who's got that kind of time? I just enjoy keeping things easy. So as we're walking back from dinner, as usual, there's a, usually a nice group of people out front of the hotel because there's still a lot of smokers in the business and everyone's out there smoking. And, and this woman calls my name and I look over and I don't recognize her. And she introduces herself and I couldn't believe it. It was Lynn LeMay. Now Lynn LeMay and I have history. There's a picture right here you're going to see from that night because I was so in my feels, I could not believe it. Lynn LeMay is one of the performers I worked with in the 90s that I had no idea where she went, what she was about. And weirdly, I didn't Google. I didn't look. There's such an assumption that if somebody doesn't reach out to you, maybe they don't want to be found. They've started a new life. There's also this level of darkness. Am I going to search for someone and find out they're no longer with us? Like, There's so much. And Lynn and I go back to 1994, 1995, probably have not seen Lynn since like 1997. Ironic that last year or a year before it was Nikki Dial, Exotica is bringing this community of us together to be present for, like I mentioned earlier, every generation of the industry 
as it was, as it is uh, together. And I lost my mind when I saw Lynn because it all came back to me in that moment. And with things that you don't think about regularly and something jocks, jostles your mind, like just gets you going, right? Just like I think about with better halves a lot of times, a mailbag question, something Brett says, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a story. Lynn LeMay played one of the greatest pranks on me that was ever played on me in my life. Not just in the business, in my life. I can picture this day like it was a week ago, probably better than a week ago. I can picture everything from that studio where it was the old Remit Studios, who was managing the studios, was Jenna's ex-husband, who was working on set that day, what the movie was, it was Tits a Wonderful Life, was Calvis contract girl, you know, Lynn LeMay was in the movie with me. We had done two scenes, one or two scenes together. Lynn and I were working together for our first time. And I was, I had met Lynn as a feature dancer at Al's Diamond Cabaret. I was very intimidated by Lynn. Lynn was dominant. She did a lot of dominatrix stuff as well. At the time, red hair, much taller than me, much more of a woman than I was, incredibly confident. Lynn had already had children before I met Lynn, which I just realized when we were sitting at dinner. We caught up a bunch of times. We really connected as friends again. And we're on this set. I'm doing my first girl, girl with toys. And Lynn brings down this duffel bag. This duffel bag looks like something the equipment manager would be carrying for an entire softball team. So imagine what I'm thinking. And Lynn lays out this duffel bag very slow process, lays a towel out. There was a couch right by the stage where we were going to be doing this scene where there were these other seats and there were the down kind of the dark area of the studio, which again, I remember lays everything out from the bag one at a time. And these were the largest toys I had ever seen in my entire life even larger than anything I'd seen in the gag section of a store or the largest and Lynn kept her composure. And so in my mind, I am like, where can I get to a phone? I think I need to call the offices at Cal Vista. I need to talk to Steve Carmelin. What the fuck is going on? And, the, and I was so afraid. Lynn had everyone on set go through with it. It wasn't until I went around Lynn to excuse myself to ask to go up to an office because I was going to use a phone before everybody absolutely died laughing. Lynn was not planning on using any of those toys on me. But that 30 minutes of my life, that one toy at a time and Lynn making eye contact and me looking around at other people that were on set, lighting guys, and the fact that everyone was in on this made it the best prank of my life. It also connected me to Lynn in a way with a sense of humor and a giggle and a laugh. And it gave Lynn a story to go and share with. I mean, it was and so I hadn't really thought of that. I mean, I thought of it when I was writing my book because I found some super hot photos of me and Lynn. And strangely, I couldn't find them on my phone. I was so mad. I was trying to Google them. This was all from Exotica because I was like, I have to show them to Justin. I have to show, this is what we look like now, people, but this is not what we looked like then. And so we laughed over that. Lynn has a crystals business. Lynn gave me this beautiful crystal to carry with me sitting on my desk right now. And we just really caught up about life. We talked that night for a while. The next day we ate together. The next, and what was strange was from that night, every time I was coming and going from the hotel, whether it be to go back over to the show, whether it be to go to dinner, no matter when it was, I crossed paths with Lynn again. Like our timing synced this show and I know we're going to stay connected, but it was another layer of a reunion. Then you had your stars. I got to see everyone. You can follow along. I'm going to do a recap reel on my IG, but Lynn LeMay with the great story, absolutely best prank of my life. And I will never forget the emotions of like, who do I call? Will I have to do that? Oh my gosh, I'm afraid. And Lynn was just dragging it out. 
and it was amazing. So thank you to everybody that came out, showed love at Exotica. I appreciate the loyal fans booth. They set it up so nice. Not only do we have snacks every day in our break area, which is right in the center of the booth. So the booth is this big square and the talent get to have a break area inside, which is really nice. Have some privacy to maybe do some posts, just wash your hands, whatever. And then on Saturdays, they have massage therapists come in. I always take advantage of a foot massage before my day is over. So thank you, real loyal fans. You are the absolute best. Thank you, Dan and Jay and the entire crew at Exotica for putting on such a dynamic show. As much as I want to say, I'm not going to do I won't say like I have now trained my um, Exotica fans very well. Not one person even got me side-eyed this entire trip. I thank you for being on your best behavior. Guest around the corner. Also, the NFL draft is around the corner. So though we may have showcased this location to you before, we're going to do it again. We're going to showcase Sapphire 39 in New York City because that is where I will be Thursday, April 25th, hosting an NFL draft party where you can wear in a team jersey and I will sit down with you after your team makes their picks so I can tell you how I think it works for your team and I can hear from you how you think it works for your team. So a little Sapphire 39 before we bring on today's guests. guests since there's only one, but multiple locations of Sapphire probably is what got me there. And they all carry my wine, Lisa by Lisa Ann. And there is one liquor store currently selling that's Williamsburg Wine and Liquor in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Guest today was a guest on my show, Better Halves on Sirius XM Raw Comedy with my co-host, Brett Raybould. This is Allie Colbert. I'm so excited to introduce her to you today. Today, I get to give you a little, little closer look at a friend that I just got to meet in studio for better halves. You can go back and listen to the episode with Allie Colbert, and you can follow Allie on all social platforms at Allie Colbert, and you can laugh with Allie on all social platforms as well. Thanks for making the time to spend a little bit more time with me, Allie. Oh my God. Thank you for having me. You know, usually when you do podcasts with comedians, they like kind of look like shit. So I just am not used to putting on makeup. And uh, now it's the second time I'm remembering if I record with you, you're going to look so put together and cute. And I'm going to look like a fucking bridge troll. Listen, I do the same makeup every day. I use the same six things so that when I'm like doing my normal thing, I look the same. This way my content is very evergreen. And I can say that was yesterday, even it was three months ago. Okay. I wear mainly only black because I don't want to sort laundry. And it is just so nice to throw all your shit in the same laundry. Like you have one white shirt. It it hangs around forever because you never know what to put it in with. You're so worried to, to ruin it. That's a fact. But what do you do to your skin? Why does your skin look so good? I take very good care of my skin. A lot of it is diet, of course. I do tan once a week because believe it or not, I have psoriasis. So I have a very severe skin condition that at times paralyzed me from being in front of the camera uh, where I couldn't work for months. So I have to really be sure that I'm taking care of it. I use Kiehl's. That's a product that I really believe in because it it replaces that waxy surface on your skin. But I I can't play around. I can't take a day without putting moisturizer on because I could have a flare up. 
Okay, but are, can I ask about like Botox and filler? Like, are we doing that? Botox, yes. Filler, no. Uh, I feel like my face is a little bit too small for filler, and I've seen a lot of women, my proportions do filler, and it looks good in a photo, but in real life, you kind of start to look like a combo between a character that someone might draw of you at Central Park or an AI version of yourself, and I'm just trying to age as gracefully as possible and just do subtle Botox. Like I like my forehead to move. I've done Botox where you're expressionless and it actually hurts your face until it wears down. So I try to keep things very moderate. Okay. Well, you look great. I want to do what you do. I appreciate you so much. Allie, how did you get here? How did you, how old were you when you discovered that you were funny and that you wanted to pursue making other people laugh? Um, when I was fun. Okay. So as a child, my dad would always like whisper funny things to me to have me then go up to strangers and say, I vividly remember this. Like he would have me and my grandparents or my grandparents, friends and like people around us were so tickled by like a six year old or a seven year old saying something like kind of crass or just like snarky. And that kind of gave me the bug and I started he always encouraged me into stand up and I started doing stand up at 17 but that was like my most formative memory of like making people laugh that that's incredible and so sweet you got to see the response on both sides you were entertaining your family that was putting you up to the task and you were quite possibly making this other person laugh as well so you became this like medium between the two senses and you pursued it you had a father that supported it because people don't get into stand up to automatically believe they're going to get rich am i correct on this yeah i mean i never was thinking about money with stand up stand up was just that like comedy and writing was that thing that I couldn't not do, which I'm sure that's how you felt about porn. But, um, you know, (laughs) as a child, but, you know, (laughs) but, you know, I just wanted to do it so bad. Like, it's just, I always wanted to make people laugh. And that was my identity in like middle school and high school was just, I wasn't the class clown. I was the person making fun of the class clown. And that got, that was fun. That's kind of because where I you was. you could be a bit smarter, you know. As a writer, yeah. you're a bit smarter, so you're going behind the joke and pulling something. You're extracting something that's even funnier. You did say, like I did with porn, but the biggest difference was I did get into porn to get rich, unlike okay. comedy. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. So laugh your way to the bank. You don't want to be a mattress actress and have nothing at the end of the day, okay? You don't do these things for nothing. And when yeah. I meet new new entertainers in the business, the first thing I ask them is like, how much money have you saved so far? And I'm so aggressive about it. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm like, oh, well, you know nothing. You cannot have any value in this world unless you prove to people that you made something of this time in your life, that it wasn't just a lifestyle and fun because it does make it a bit harder to enter back into the regular workplace. I can't, I mean, I think about that all the time. I just can't imagine how, did you watch the Stormy Daniels documentary? Not yet. I'm saving it and I'm thinking about watching it on this trip because I'm going to get to see Stormy uh, in two days in Chicago. And so I want to definitely make sure that I have some follow-up questions for her and I want to watch it. Did you watch it? I watched it and it's amazing just how this line of work really can interfere with your ability to live like a quote unquote normal life. It just, it bites you. It it, can, it has the potential to bite you in the ass in so many ways. Like the people that you work with or like starting a family or entering relationships, different lines of work, you know, um, uh, moving and, and something as simple as moving and it's something as simple as getting a new neighbor. I had to admit to Brett on the show a month ago, like, Hey Brett, I got a new neighbor. And guess what? If this neighbor is a super fan, I have to move. And he's like, Whoa, I never thought about that. I'm like, yes. Oh, every why would you have single to move? First, well, because you'll be creeped out. You know what I mean? If you don't feel safe, you're going to move. So yeah. it's a safety issue too. And that's what I find so fascinating about this coming out party for OnlyFans, which I think is fantastic, especially for creators that were already in this space to be able to own their content and get residuals. But as for the rest of the world jumping in and thinking this is just some get rich scheme, 
they're not thinking about the list that you just gave and the things that I've experienced. So there is a trade-off and it has to be momentously valuable for you to give up all of these things over here for this thing over here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I felt that way watching and you'll, I have to hear your thoughts and you watch it, but watching the Stormy Daniels documentary, because it really was one of the few ways that a lot of people I'll say, even though I'm speaking about Stormy specifically, like are able to lift themselves out of poverty and create a new life for themselves where they don't need a specific degree that they don't have, you know, the money to finance, but like, it, it just, it can do that for you. So I have to give it props in that way. Like if you're owning it and you, you're your own agent, you know what I mean? And it also provided me the opportunity to fill a passport and travel around the world on somebody else's dime. The only yeah. state this business did not pay me to go to was Alaska. And that's because once I did the Sarah Palin thing, they wouldn't have me there because the state loved her so much that every club was like, no, you know, we can't do it. We, we're afraid we'll have protesters. Everyone here loves her so much. I'm like, man, I was trying to find a way to make Alaska my last state in the U.S. that, again, I did not pay to go to someone else paid me to go there. Wow. So that was kind Wait, of for what me, is the Sarah Palin thing? So I was the star of Who's Nail and Palin, which is a series during the 2008 <laughs> election. If you remember, because it was kind of part of pop culture, I was who played Sarah Palin. And oh, wow. I was in the Eminem video as Sarah and Palin. Like this thing gave me a lot of mainstream credibility. So I was like, finally, I'm going to get to go to Alaska and go and dance there. Every club was like, no, we can't. So I ended up going, on my own, but enough about me. Let's go. We're going to go back and forth. But for you, okay. you write all of your own material. What does the yes. day of yours look like, Allie? Are there hours that you set aside to writing? I'm sure there's times you're speaking to manager, agent, people with different shows, logistics. That's part of something that most people don't really think about the behind the scenes life of a comedian. You're in LA right now. You travel, you've got to map out all these things. How often do you write and what's your average day look like? Um, okay. I don't know that it, it's tough, like in the way that it is for, I think most freelancers to like maintain a schedule. There's some, the upside is like, you do have that flexibility to move things around and things can come up and you get to do them and participate. Them. Yeah. But the other side is like just having some sort of structure to your every day. You know, I will try to write every day, even if it's not for stand up, if it's like a project that I'm working on or a movie I want to get made or an idea I have for a short film or TV, whatever it is. So having a few hours where even if I don't actually write pages I'm thrilled with, but like just being like, I'm going to write, I'm going to be creative during this time, I'm going to put pen to paper. And then I think like how the rest of the day unfolds would be like a podcast, Zooms, meetings. There's so much networking with other creatives just to be a part of what's happening and the language and the zeitgeist, like all of this bullshit that sounds really lofty, but I, I do think matters to the life of someone that like is in the arts. It's just like being in conversation and what is interesting to people and what other creators are doing. So you can be a part of kind of that, that, I don't know, beat. Uh, and it, it's time consuming because you're working on everybody else's time frame. And it's, it is important. The networking is endless. I don't know about you, but there's always at the end of the day where I'm like, oh, I didn't get in that one call or I didn't get to get back to that one person or there's never enough time. But I love that you do that with your writing because as an independent contractor, you know, and, and you're freelancers, creators, your time can be very elastic, which isn't good for everyone. Because if you don't set some structure, like for me, it's getting up every morning and going to the gym. That's kind of like my structure is like, once I do that, everything else is going to land in place. Because if I don't do that, then, you know, uh, and I, I have my day detailed out, but that, that downtime with writing is really just giving you your routine. It's giving you your time of still, and it's also you're, you're creating, your mind is going and that day might not matter, but two weeks from now, you might start writing something else and be like, you know what? Let me go back to that Tuesday, two weeks ago. I think this ties in with that. Yeah. I, I, I like what you said though, about the gym. Like I almost feel like I need to prioritize the movement even before the writing, when I'm in LA, it's so easy to get in. I try and do the 10,000 steps a day. 
when I'm in LA, it's easy to hit. Like I'll wake up, I get my coffee, I walk to the beach, I come back. It's like 45 nice. minutes. It's great. In, nice. L- in New York, it's been quite, I haven't, I don't oh, want to rain. be outside. Oh. I, it's awful. It's oh. awful. But I need to get like out and move for a minute before I like can get into writing. So even if I don't go like work out, if I just can walk for an hour, I'm happy. Yeah, because I'm sure you felt great after walking to the beach this morning, right? Like that yeah. just opens you up so much. But when it's raining for three, four days, what are you supposed to do? And if you're not a gym person, like if walking on the treadmill is not going to give you that same vibe, then it's waste. I know. I mean, and New York, it's just, New York is such a brutal city. Like I like New York because people want to see other people and they hustle. Everyone's working hard. I love yeah. those things about New York, but it's not a very redemptive city. Like if you are not a billionaire and most people aren't, <laughs> your life in New York is just brutal. It's just it's difficult to, <laughs> to get places. You go back to your shitty apartment. Even if it's expensive, <laughs> it's shitty. You're like living in a cage. The weather's terrible. To get groceries, you have to get in a car. The car's expensive. Or you take the subway, you get punched in the face. You get home, you get raped. Like it's just nothing is good. You know, it's so like <laughs> it's terrible. I a post the other day, a girl wrote, New York City, the only place you can spend $8,000 a month on rent and you're still afraid to walk outside of your apartment. Like, I'm like, what? It's awful. Like, at least in LA, I have space in my house and it's nice outside. So at, at the very least, I can do that. But people in LA, I don't know why I'm talking LA versus New York, but they don't want to like get together in the same way. No one leaves their area. No one leaves their house. No one really has a job. I don't know what anyone's doing. It was very different for me. It was definitely not as social. You know, here in the city, you could just get together with somebody for an hour or two, go for a walk. You'll meet up in between other meetings and people stick to plans here. That was one of the things I had that was hard in LA too. It was like, oh, well, maybe we'll get together. Oh, well, traffic's going to be too bad. Oh, and it's just like, you're always almost making plans where my friends here were like, hey, next Thursday, you want to do dinner? Yes, we will not talk again until the following Wednesday to confirm Thursday. Boom, yeah. we're done. It is yeah. a different vibe, but it's nice to go back and forth and have that break of the weather, the break of having a car versus walking everywhere, all those things. Where do you feel you're most creative? That's such a good question. I think I, if, I feel like whenever I've just like overextended in one city, then I then I fall in love with the other place. Like I've just I was just coming off of like two weeks in New York, so now I'm thrilled that I'm here. But in two fucking days, I'm gonna want to blow my brains out with the Haley Bieber smoothie because the people <laughs> here are atrocious. I mean, yes, they're they just are. they're disgusting. So <laughs> it depends. But I do appreciate the fact that in New York, everyone works and they value work and they want to work hard. And here people are floating through sound bath and nothing and they did this for their vagus nerve and it's just so much bullshit it's very hard to cut through I agree. I felt the same way. I mean, I was out there for 30 years. My first 15 was in Huntington Beach, so it was totally different. I was living in a beach city that was awesome in the 90s because it was like cheap and fun. Then I moved to LA and I was like, oh my gosh, you have to get dressed up to go to Starbucks. Like you have a full face of makeup on at 6.30 in the morning at fucking Starbucks. Like, I, but And also Starbucks in New York, Starbucks LA. Is New York, if you talk to the person behind you, they talk back. You just have this little banter. <laughs> LA, you do that to people, they look at you like you need to be locked up. Like they will look up from their phone, shoot you a look. It's different. I also enjoy when you are walking in New York, you're taking an early morning walk and you see like delivery guys who you would think, man, that job's got to suck. They work so hard. They're they're always joking around with each other and having the time of their lives while they're working. They're just like, this is what we do and we're going to make the most of it. And I love that vibe. I love walking by that and think, man, good for you guys. You're good coworkers. Yeah. There's just, there is a spirit to New York. That's just, it's just not how it is here. It's just not. When you're in LA, do you go to the comedy store? Do you do walk-ins or do you schedule shows all over so people can see you everywhere? Um, when I'm in LA, the club that I perform at the most is the improv. And, and then there are just, and I also perform at Westside Comedy Club because I live on the West Side, so that's pretty convenient. But then there's just like a medley of other shows outside of the main clubs. And I perform at those like a couple times a week. So, you know, that's another thing about LA is like to do stand up. I mean, 
I'm speaking for myself. I know there's comedians that like they do tons of sets a night, but you can't even get across the city in the way that you can in New York. So in New York, you can maybe pick up two, three shows a night and like you can just bop around the corner. It'll take 90 minutes. In LA, if you're doing two, three shows, you leave your house at five. You don't get back till midnight. You know, like it takes so long. So everything is paced back here, which is nice, but then you want to kill yourself. Yeah, and the, out of those hours that you are missing uh, from being home, 75% of them is sitting in your car in traffic trying to find a spot. If you do use valet, you've got to worry it's going to take them an hour to get your car because right. like when you go to the comedy store, they just park your car on the street blocks away. You could wait for it. It's easier to just get an Uber. It's like, it is easier here. I've heard, I've heard comedians tell me like, oh, I'll just get on the train. I can pick up like three, four shows in a night and there yeah. are places close together. And there's such a scene here. Where is the audience better when it comes to East Coast versus West Coast? New York versus LA or New York fans more into it, quiet? I, I mean, I think oh, I think the level of stand-up is more sophisticated in New York. I think overall there are better, harder working comedians in New York because they're up more. And again, it's that hustle culture. I think the audiences there are discerning and fair and good. And then I think, it, I think it just depends on, it, it kind of goes for whatever city you're at, but like the audience at like a club show where you're seated and you have a two drink minimum and you've had this reservation is different than the audience of people kind of like stumbling into, you know, a bar on the East side where they're half engaged and they don't expect so much. So you kind of feel that wherever you're going, but I mean, they're both, they're both good. I, it's really different parts of the country where you feel like, Oh, I can't really say that. It's got to be different. So you travel all over the U.S. Where have you had a show where you've realized like, oh, that term doesn't land here? Oh, God. I you know I haven't been on the road in like a year now. I've just been like writing and do, performing in New York and L.A. So, um, I mean, last time it? that I had... No, not at all. I'm very happy to be seated. But last <laughs> time I had that experience was in Montana. Okay. And like, it was just not like, it's just so outside of what I'm used to performing for stand up and some of my content, like in terms of like sexuality, not even just like queer stuff, but just like sex forward stuff from a woman, like the, the, the reception of the, that material was like much more hesitant. And people were, they're just more resistant to it, you know, like, especially coming out of my mouth, like we're like petite brunettes. Um, people are they like, don't wait, expect what? It, right? No. Yeah, they don't no. expect it. And you're still in a space in comedy where a lot of comedy clubs are, are not used to having as many female comics. And now you bring in you, Allie, as a female comic who is living your authentic self, speaking your truth, talking about what it's like in the lesbian culture, dating, now being in a relationship all of those things stacked against you in some places. I'm sure you walk into room, small town America, and you're like, okay, this person has a problem with the fact that I'm a girl. There's just that. Okay, these people are not going to understand that I'm a lesbian. Like, you have to be going through that in your mind, but you still have to do your set. Yeah, I mean, something that I would like to pride myself on with my material is like, I don't consider myself like, I'm such a woke, liberal, lesbian, hear my fucking pronoun. I'm like, I am like a lesbian that is palatable for all of America. I, I'm not policing language. I make jokes about like the breakdown of lesbian relationships. Like I talk about like the boy one and the girl one, like, and believe it or not, like most people ranging the political gamut can like get behind that material. If anything, the people that have issues with that material are like super liberal woke people will actually have a problem with that material when I'm actually just making being queer more accessible for everyone. So I, it's, it's a catch 22. And they have a problem with it because they're almost correcting you because they don't feel that you're being woke enough by how you're addressing the topics that are a hundred percent. You know, but like you don't have to go all the way there. You just the most important thing in any stand up act is being present, being yourself. Yeah. You, you said you didn't, you like being seated. Being on the road is brutal. It is a constant quest for 
How shitty is my hotel going to be? Am I going to get to sleep? What kind of food is around? It's just a constant scavenger hunt in a sense. Yeah, it's brutal. And like, we're so lucky that we live in LA, New York. Like my immune system, when I go on the road, not to sound like such a weak, feeble Jew, but like it crashes. (laughs) I get so sick because I barely sleep. And then the food is awful. Like there's like no fucking food. Seriously. It's like fast food, fried food. I can't find a piece of fruit. For miles. I couldn't find a piece of vegetable a- in St. Louis until I went to a Starbucks and found one of those little pre-made boxes. And I'm like, I don't care if this apple is from a week ago. I, I, that is so tough and it's so real. You go places, why is everything fried? Can I get something without ranch? Like, they, And they look at you like, what do you mean? I know. It's really insane. It's like, I guess like the, the value system on like healthy food, I don't know if it's like, I don't even think it's like socially, like people are craving it in the same way. Like, I feel like there's just like a delay in the like awareness around that. I I mean, I sound like a coastal elitist asshole, but like, come on, make a salad. Uh, No, look, I struggled with it for years on the road. I ended up always making sure I had a small fridge in my room. And as soon as I get picked up at the airport, I'd go to the grocery store and just buy like some bananas, some instant oatmeal, like things that I could survive on because it became so frustrating. You'd be so hungry. You'd be looking around that you still wouldn't get what you wanted. And that's when your immune system crashes. So I travel with an air purifier. You know, they, they make these mini ones. I travel with a a humidifier. I travel with all these things because sometimes you can walk into a hotel room and you can be like, I'm going to get sick staying here. It just has a musty smell. It's super dusty. And you know that when you wake up in the morning, no matter how you sleep, your mouth is going to be gross. Your nose is going to be clogged. What is that? Why can't they just put air purifiers in these rooms? Uh, It's so bad. And I used to like, it was, if I had like one drink, I would, I was like, I'm going to be dead when I wake up. Like that's all I needed to tip myself over and just like, you can't because then you, it becomes unsustainable and you have to like push shows and then you miss the next one. It's like, it's just, it's just really hard that life. And for you and I both, you know, speaking to people in person, your biggest fear at a gig on the road is losing your voice because you're oh useless. My God. Yeah. Now you're stuck in a hotel feeling useless. I, that was terrible. I would do the nebulizer and stuff like, yeah, it's brutal. Do you carry so an air bad. purifier? No, I don't carry an air purifier. That feels like a lot. Um, it's all, okay, it's only the size of this can, believe it or not. I'm going to send really? you some links on Amazon. Yep. Okay. It's the size of this can. And it's it's pretty – it charges, so you can USB charge it and then put it in different spots. I usually just plug it in when I get into a room and blare it for like the first couple of hours. Then I'll like move it into the bathroom. It does make a huge difference. I'm, no, I'm sure it does because the dryness. You wake up with a sore throat no matter what. You and know? the humidifier, you just screw a bottle of water onto it and you put it right by your bedstand. And by the time you wake up, that bottle of water is empty. Also, I love that. No, that's here. so yeah. good. Wait, Lisa, so Lisa, were you on the road like for filming like shoots or are you doing audience like meet and so, greets? Like what do you do? Yeah. I feature dance for almost 30 years. I started my career in this business as a dancer. So I started okay. in Northeast Philly. Then I went to Reading to a club that had the, all the features, the stars, the magazine models, the porn stars coming in. And I was just like, oh my gosh, these women are doing the same thing as me, but they're traveling the world and getting paid so much money. And to me, I realized if I just shoot one movie a month, I could go out on the road three weekends a month. So I, mm-hmm. I made the road my full-time gig. Uh, it's great money. It's harder work. I enjoyed it in the beginning when you're a nobody, you do shows Monday through Saturday. So you do anywhere between 20 to 24 shows a week because they want you to do like a noon, a 5 PM, a 7 PM, a 10 PM. Like it is, you have makeup on 20 hours a day for your, then you start to raise your rate next thing you know, by the end of your career, you're only doing Thursday, Friday, Saturdays or Fridays and Saturdays, but still you're on the road every weekend. So after I did the Sarah Palin bit 2008, I did four years where I only took off two weekends, Christmas and Thanksgiving. I did 50 weekends a year on the road and it was absolute torture. Oh my but God. I had a financial plan and I really wanted to get there. And I was like, I know Way I can go. get there doing this. And I, and I just grinded. Also knew that that popularity was so incredible and I was getting offered the work at that price. But it got to the point where 
I'd say like 2013, 2014, where I just started to see more incidents in clubs, big fights, like things, you know, happening. And I was like, eh, is this where you want to die? Like, you know, you're in your 40s right. now. Like I remember being on stage one night where bottles started getting thrown across this stage because one group in Rhode Island started fighting with the other. When the cops came in, they just opened cans of base and like like tear gas to get everybody out of the building without realizing that we, the dancers, were in the dressing room in the basement. So we all had to be trapped down. It was like the most horrific experience. I remember thinking like, yeah, I've seen this world at its best and now we're living in a different time and maybe – this is time to hang up the clear heels. Like it just was a, a thought. I, I I migrated out of it slowly, but I had this ongoing conversation with myself and it would normally happen while I was on stage, while wow. I was doing my show, where I would be like, is this really a smart choice at this age? It just really was habit. This is what I did since I was a teenager. This is what made me who I am. This was where I was comfortable, um, but I had to break that comfort before something bad potentially happened to me. So I started to really evaluate, make those better decisions. Whoa. So when you're doing 50 weekends a year, what are your friendships like? Like, do you have friends that you're connecting with just over the phone? Are you dating at all? Or you feel really alone during that, that year? Um, never really alone. I always traveled with someone. I also made friends all over the U S. So there was always a lunch happening with somebody, a dinner happening with somebody, because after all these years of traveling, you meet girls in the industry who no longer dance, but still want to see you when you're in town, maybe the DJ. So it became very social. Really. My best friends have been my best friends since I moved to California in the early nineties. And they've always been great with, I would mail home strip club t-shirts, uh, for my best friend's husband. He still has like a whole collection of every weekend a strip club t-shirt and I would send them postcards. I would write them letters all through the nineties. And before the internet, I wrote letters to everyone. And then once we had the ability to email, I would just keep in touch by email. We had a phone call. We didn't FaceTime yet, uh, but yeah. I kept in touch and I would do, you know, Sundays and Mondays, I would be in New York City because I started my fantasy football show in 2013. So I'd fly from my dance gig Saturday night to New York Sunday Monday night, I'd do my show. Midnight, I'd get out of there. 6 a.m., I'd be on the flight to L.A. I'd go to L.A. I'd shoot or direct a movie on Wednesday and Thursday or Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I'd go right back out on the road. And this was just a vicious What the fuck? So you're not dating. You're not dating. At that well, – I don't do that anymore. Uh, I don't live that life anymore. But I'll tell you but what you I did. But you weren't dating. How the fuck do you date during that schedule? I wasn't dating. I had people in my life that I was close with, that I was comfortable with, but it was funny. I remember my one neighbor who had a leased car. She would always get so mad at me. She'd be like, how many miles are on your car? You're gone all the time. I'm like, oh, there's like, after two years, like 8,000 miles on my car. She's like, I'm paying for all these extra miles. And I remember that whole banter of like, you just don't realize what your life is like when you're living in two places and when you're on the road all the time. You don't even realize you're not using half your stuff, but you're still paying all of your bills. Oh my God. I know. I know. I feel that way be just because the nature of like our work, I mean, we're not doing the same thing, but I'm starting in, in porn now, but, um, just traveling <laughs> so much, like you go back to your house and you like, haven't been to your house, you know, or like, and you so don't, you don't disgusting. cook in your house. You don't have groceries. You don't get new groceries because you're leaving in a few more days. So you're always in the in-between. Always in the in-between. Always. Do you plan on going back out on the road more? Is that something in the future plans for this year now that you're working yes. on some solid ride? Okay. Yes, Tell totally. Us, where do you want to go? Oh, gosh. Festivals, where do I want to go? Festivals. Favorite I mean, cities. I'm going to Colorado next week. I I just want to see more of the uh, the U.S. I'd love to do more like shows in the Midwest. I'd love to do shows down south. Like I just want to move throughout the country more. The last time I was touring, I did kind of all along the West Coast, and I've done a bunch of East Coast shows. So I really need to like catch the in between. You should. I mean, get down to like Savannah, Georgia. I, I dorked out and did every single sightseeing adventure tour, saw every zoo, every wildlife sanctuary, every butterfly sanctuary. Like if there was a 
thing for flyers in the front of the hotel. We would check in. I would just like grab everything. Now we have the internet. You could just look up what there is to do. But it does put it all together for you. We went to some churches in the South on Sundays to really be a part of what that felt like. Now, the food, the culture, and my first couple of years on the road, I drove. So you would we would stop at like all the like random rest side places that were making like weird pies or things. You'd eat it all because it was so fun. But yeah, getting out in the U.S., it's so different. Like LA and New York are like their own continents when you start getting into places like Alabama and Kentucky and Ohio. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And and also the fun thing about like this, this type of work is just like the days are free, you know, the shows are at night. So when you're traveling, you do have time. So like, and I remember hotels having the, the flyers in front. So I know exactly what you're talking about, but like just to explore a place and just fuck around. Yeah, just fuck around. Are you a nap? Do you get a nap before your show or can you not nap? No, I'm obsessed with napping. I just have tried to cut them out because sometimes the naps can be like, they kind of can fuck up my day. And sometimes if the show is late and I nap, I really get disoriented. So I'm trying not to nap and just get better sleep. I really think I just need to go to sleep earlier. That's tough. That's tough because your let your nights are late, and then when you have a night off from doing shows, it's hard to say. Oh well, I was up last night till two. Tonight I'm going to make myself go to bed till nine. Good luck with that. I know, but staying up late and sleeping late, yes, it's it's the nature of the job. But like, it is so bad for my mental health. Those I hours agree. of sleep, you know, I like, agree. It, with I feel you. so happy when I'm up early. Oh my, especially like in the city, cause it's a little bit quieter when it's early. Right. And you're like, I did, I beat everybody else. I'm awake and nobody knows I'm awake yet. You just feel like you have this little bit of time when you sleep in, you check your phone. You're like, Oh my gosh, I have all these emails. I've got to respond to all these. It's very stressful. Yes. I want that quiet moment in the morning. That's the best. At least you are aware of what works and doesn't work for your mental health. That's such an important space to stay in, especially because you are bouncing. Your girlfriend lives in New York or in LA? She lives in New York. Okay. So good. So when you're back here and then when you're out there, but that's another reason why you're going to want to come back sooner than later. Yeah. She makes me want to go back to New York. I like hanging out with her. And then you can get an extra writing when you're in LA. Yeah, exactly. Totally. I love she works so hard in New York. Like it, it, I, sh- I have plenty of time to write. Like she's just such a career person that it's not like she's being like, let's hang out. Like she's got stuff going on. What does she do? She's an investigative reporter for the times. How exciting. So she's an incredibly curious person. Uh, yeah. She, it's did, very did you- hard to cheat on her. Oh, of, I mean, she sees all the signs of everything. Are you kidding me? She suspects uh, yeah. something before it even, but that's an interesting career. She has to study research, dig in deep and fall into something that could be a little bit traumatic, you know, yeah. but still continue to uncover it. That's a very emotional place to be career wise, but good for her and good for you. You landed a, a rock star. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Allie, I loved sitting here with you today and I loved having you in studio. Isn't Brett like the perfect yin to my yang? Brett is such a sweetie. I'm going to do his show in New York. I loved, I lo- I loved the whole crew of Paul, right? Was Paul Paul's there? amazing. Yeah. I love you. I love Paul. I love Brett. I mean, it's just good vibes over there. I, cr- I completely agree. I am so happy to be a part of it. We just wrapped season two and we have Congrats. a call today at four to set up all of our studio days for our next round. But Ali Colbert, everybody, please follow. I will make sure everyone has your info. Your domain is the same and your podcast as well is. Yes. I'm just at Ali Colbert, A-L-I Colbert with a K on everything. So okay. that's you. You can find me there. I have all my show dates. I have the podcast feed. And everything that I'm doing is there. Allie Colbert, everybody, make sure you give a follow and show your support. I will see you again soon, Allie. Thank you so much for yes, joining me please. today. please. So nice seeing you. Allie is hilarious. Uh, I am going to get to see Allie again in a week or so. Allie is back and forth between New York and LA. And if you want to sit and laugh with Allie, Allie Colbert, all social media, check out a live show, uh, just cracking jokes nonstop. And just that a hilarious sense of humor, just that dry, like just talking about things. You just know you laugh. And if you haven't heard how funny Allie was when Allie visited me and Brett on Better Halves, if you're a user of the SiriusXM app, 
you can just search Better Halves and check out our whole library. If you are a listener in the car or in series, Raw Comedy, Channel 99, replays go throughout, but we get new episodes land every Friday, 10 a.m., 5 p.m., 10 p.m. Eastern time. Those are the drop times of the new episodes, and then it replays. But again, the SiriusXM app, pretty easy way to listen to anything at any time. Any time for you to write to me a question, maybe so. Ask Lisa Ann at gmail.com. The moment you've been waiting for it is the mailbag. That's right. If you want to join the fun right here, be a part of the curiosity, ask Lisa Ann at gmail.com. We got one right here from Jeremy. Here we go. Hey, Lisa. New podcast was great. I loved hearing about your life hacks. I will be vacuum sealing winter clothes. It probably keeps them fresher too. It does. Believe it or not, puffy things. Now look, linen and stuff's going to wrinkle no matter what. You can sit in linen and wrinkles. But like your sweaters, your jackets, your stuff, your big bulky bulky, you shrink that stuff down. Somehow it takes so much air out, it doesn't wrinkle. And it's very satisfying. Be mindful of the weight because you can stuff one of those big, big, big bags and then shrink it down and not be able to move it. I have done that. I use it for household items as well. My backup set of pillows, comforter, blankets for my guests in my guest bedroom. I shrink wrap that up, saves a ton of space. It's amazing to think that it would take a whole cabinet folded, but it's just this little brick shrunk up. So keeps things fresh. I love sharing life hacks, vacuum sealer bags, moving the winter clothes out. Question is, what inspired you to develop your own brand of wine? And does it feel surreal seeing your name on the bottles at restaurants? Do you recommend any good food pairings? I look forward to the chance to try Lisa by Lisa Ann. So what kind of inspired me was I had been looking for really a connection to Italy. So Italy was the start. So keep that in mind. It wasn't wine at all. It was Italy. So I continued to have the conversation with friends that I wanted to find a way somehow to make Italy a part of my future life, whether it's buying a place there that I live at and retire at, whether it's getting a place there that I'm going to rent out as an Airbnb, whether it's making more friends there and learning more areas. But after spending that month in 2018 in Italy, I realized that I felt such a connection there and it was something that I really wanted to find a way to bring closer to me. So the first thing was having the conversations with my people about Italy. And then obviously my friends that are straight from Italy, Italian still their first language. I'm going to be talking to them about this the most. Any new ideas? Have you heard from anyone? What's going on over there? What's going on with your friends over there? What's going on with family? And that's how wine came to me. A friend of mine said, Hey, friends of my family have this winery in Sicily. They're looking for a way to bring more wine over to here. Da, 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 da great. Let's meet with them on a Zoom. Let's start talking to them. Let's learn about the winery and let's see what makes this unique. Sicily's very unique, but it's a connection with my dad's side of the family. My dad's side of the Italian family, they, that's Sicilian based. So having that connection was like another layer. I was really excited about the nature aspect as well. Cause I was like, okay, later life hobby, business. This isn't a business I looked at that was going to bring me riches. Although anything is always possible and it's never good to look at something like, but it wasn't something that I was pining after because it had to be successful. I was pining after it because I wanted to be involved. I wanted to belong and I wanted it to become part of my conversation. So it was kind of there, there, and there. And then the development of a new project, you know, seeing my names on a bottle, it's more fun knowing for me who was connected to all of it. You know, it was Kay who introduced me to Samantha who does my logos. Then from the logo, I went back to my guy, Eddie in Huntington Beach, and he helped me with the label. Then to the label, to being able to bring Kay to New York to shoot content, to go to the different locations. Then the locations that are selling the wine, I've met through friends of friends or people that I've already known in the city. And there's this like, I know you, you own this restaurant, your best friend owns this restaurant. Uh, So it became this another networking project kind of thing. The whole thing is surreal because of the mapping out of not being stuck to one thing, but knowing that Italy was part of the one thing and being able to be open-minded. What would it be? Would I be part of a business first? Would I buy a property first? And now here I am. As for pairings, you know, this is the red that I know a lot of my friends will enjoy chilled, which I don't normally drink a red chilled, but I've drank this red chilled because it's a nice light beautiful Norella Mascalese, nice grape. 
not too sweet. You're always going to stick with your sames. I always tell, you know, everyone always says your whites are going to go with your lighter meats and your darks are going to go with your darker meats, right? So your reds are going to go with your darker meats, your, but your whites are going to go with your fish, your chicken, what have you. But you can also think about daytime, nighttime, right? Maybe your white is lighter. You like the Grillo. There's a really nice dehydrated grape from that region of Sicily with that altitude taking the sugar out. It's amazing. Uh, and nice and white, fresh with a salad. So you're going to have to try them. When you want to get them, you're going to have to go to Williamsburg Wine and Liquor. Barge was just loaded. My next pallets are on their way over. We are completely tapped out when it comes to the sales end of Lisa by Lisa Ann. Uh, so waiting for the next pallets to get over here so I can get out there, but you will have it at all of the restaurants listed on the Instagram at Lisa by Lisa Ann. So thank you for that one. Let's go to the next one. I wanted to ask you something, Lisa, if I were to visit New York, what kind of recommendations would you add to my bucket list itinerary? What are the best shows? Where can I go to eat the best food? What are the most beautiful areas to visit? What are the most underrated places to see? What are the most overrated places? Should I practice yelling at people to fit in with the culture? Please let me know when I can listen to my, your show. You've been an inspiration. My show is every Wednesday, my podcast drops. And then every Friday at 8 PM Eastern time as a YouTube live premiere on my YouTube channel, they sit there forever. So you get to enjoy when it comes to places to visit things to do. I say the best thing to do your first time coming to York is look at the map, look at the boroughs, divide your quadrants and, and, and plan. We would like to be lower East side. We would like to be upper East side. We'd like to be midtown map it out that way. What I have found about people that live in New York is if you take 10 different people and you ask them their top 10 restaurants and why they're all going to give you different restaurants because we're not as trendy as LA where it's like, Oh, everyone eats at Nobu. Like there's a million restaurants here. So it's not that way but everybody has a personal connection to the places they eat. All of the places I frequent are places that either are family owned by a family that I know, friends are investors in, friends work at, friends manage, like nobody just goes somewhere to go. So there's that personal connection, which you have to find. When it comes to a show, it's hard for you to not know someone and know what kind of show they would like, but I find any form of live entertainment is exciting. So if you just want to be, go with the wild card. You go in line, the cheap tickets in times square. Okay. When you go there, they're selling tickets that are available in theaters. That they're trying to fill and they're usually at a great price and it's a roll of the dice. You get to go to a show unexpectedly that you, you know about what time you want to go, but it's a roll with it. You should yell at some people, but be very careful because the city's a bit wild. So don't yell at everyone. Be very careful. It is a time to be more careful than ever when coming to the city. But spread it out. See it all. Of course, you imagine the Statue of Liberty is awesome. It's a great ferry ride over there. Empire State Building is awesome. But if you don't do those things early, they do get very busy. They're tourist places. There's so much to do. Little Italy is a great walking spot. Bryant Park is absolutely magnificent. The New York Public Library is an undervalued, underseen uh, spot that I make everybody go to. But there's a million things to do. But look at the map. Look at the boroughs. Decide where you want to go and plant yourself in each one every day that you're here. I hope you enjoy your trip, Maddie. Last but not least, fantasy baseball. Let's go Mets. I didn't really feel there'd be a way to bring the wine back into the conversation once I went Mets or fantasy baseball. So I saved this one for last. We've got our friend here that says, hey, Lisa, I'm a big fan of your work. You're my favorite adult performer of all time. I really enjoy your podcast and everything sports and fantasy football related. I have both of your books and I'm currently reading the life and absolutely loving it. I follow all of your current projects. Now that baseball season has officially officially started, what does your fantasy baseball team look like? Any specific players you like or that you are keeping your eye on? How do you feel about the pitch clock? Thank you for all you do. Keep doing you. Hope you write another book soon. Wishing you all the best. Let's go Mets. All right, Iman, this is a great question. I 
do not play fantasy baseball anymore. And I will say what happened. So I decided I was going to start playing fantasy baseball in 2015 because that was when I wanted to start doing sports radio full time. And I learned the only way to stay on air all time was to cover fantasy baseball because there's that law between football seasons. A lot of the top fantasy football analysts only do football season, which I'm not saying only because it really is from July until the end of April with the draft. So it's really a long season. You can really draw that out that way to be, be active. You need to speak radio baseball. So I was like, I'm going to study baseball and I'm going to play fantasy baseball at the same time. And I realized I loved baseball, but fantasy baseball is enough to make you not love baseball. That's what ended up happening. I played for two seasons. My second season, I came in second place and I said to everyone, that's it. I'm leaving on a high note. I will never come in second place again. This was absolutely grinding. It was daily lineup changes. I remember it was the month that I was in. It was the year that I was in Italy for a month and I was over there getting trade offers, different time zone, not good internet. Like, so, but your questions really struck me because of an interview yesterday that I watched on Pat McAfee. Jet Passon was on. And we know when we want to talk baseball, Jet Passon is the guy. He's got a great voice. He's very smooth on the radio. He absolutely loves baseball. So there's nobody passionate person. I love when they bring on Jet because Jet really brings it when it comes to like that is his category, right? It's like I mentioned a minute ago about some people only covering football. But when you said, how do you feel about the pitch clock? I've been having these conversations about how some people are starting to assume that the pitch clock is what's causing all of these additional injuries on the best arms in pitching. And as this has been something that I've been talking about for a couple of weeks, Jet Passing comes on McAfee yesterday and says, actually, no, these injuries are stemming from overusing the arm when they're young because a lot of these local small teams Parents, coaches are not following protocols and they're putting kids out there at such a young age when their arms are actually developing. So now it's going to be common ground that everybody has to have a surgery, whether it's before they get into the big leagues or after. So he wrote this book called The Arm. And it was, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm just saying, this is your question came in and I had just listed a jet so passionately talk about this. And then I was like, I had to answer this question because people blame me in on the pitch clock. Jet made it very clear. My opinion on the pitch clock. I love it. I absolutely love it. I went to a game last year. K got to go Yankees game. Awesome game. Sitting behind the mound is awesome. I'm, I'm sorry. Behind home plate is awesome now because right where you're sitting, you're seeing this clock. There's some urgency. It reminds me of being at an NBA game and watching the shot clock. You know, you have to pay attention. You know, you can't look away. You know, there's going to be more steals. You know, all of these things are going to be happening, making it for a more exciting product. Shaving 35, 40 minutes off a game is also awesome, especially for families. Now I know some of the ballparks would complain because it's cut into their selling of, of goods time, but look, we're, it's probably better for families because it's more affordable, but not be subjected to more time to have to buy more things. So I love the pitch clock, but I think this would be an interesting book for you, Iman. If you're really into fantasy baseball, check it out. It's called the arm, uh, on McAfee jet was great yesterday. Although he did throw some digs in and Gumpy that I wasn't thrilled about. We'll get to that another time, but to all of you, if you want to be a part of the mailbag, it's ask Lisa Ann at gmail.com. Check out my store shoplisaann.com where you'll find both of my books. Uh, I've got some eight by tens I've been selling on there and I'm adding book markers on there this week by request. Uh, Backstage Convos, another podcast that I do and all of the things that I'm doing can be found in one place that is on my social media at The Real Lisa Ann. Give me a follow right there. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for listening to an all new episode of The Lisa Ann Experience.